Good morning and welcome to Faith for Living here at Lakeside Chautauqua as we uh, conclude our series with uh, Dr. Lisa Wolf from Oklahoma City University in Oklahoma. She has been talking with us this week about um, uppity women of the Bible and how that relates to our current situation. And she's brought us wonderful insights that we appreciate very much. Yesterday's presentation was live streamed because of the weather. And so um, there's outlines here of the uh, presentation from yesterday uh, on RISPA. And uh, this morning, she's going to talk to us about Hold of the Prophetess. So we're looking forward to that very much. I remind you that following our session today, we'll be having a book signing on the, on the uh, porch of Hotel Lakeside. And Lisa will have in the fine print our two books, Ruth Esther, Song of Solomon and Judith, and the Wisdom Commentary on Koheleth, that uh, Lisa's is mo Lisa's most recent book that uh, was published in March. I would like to remind you that this evening is Vespers right here at the Steel Memorial Bandstand. It will be led by the Reverend Karen Graham, who's bringing us a summer series on the fruits of the Spirit, and Holy Communion will also be celebrated. And then this coming Sunday, we have as our guest preacher, Father Michael Renninger from St. Mary's Catholic Church in Richmond, Virginia, and he will be with us live uh, to bring greetings here at the bandstand and then live stream on Sunday, and during next week, his Faith for Living will be here, and we, we welcome him. And also a, a book study next week on uh, The Problem of Pain by C.S. Lewis, and that will be Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday afternoons. At this time, would you welcome back to our pulpit and to share with us uh, Dr. Lisa Wolf. Thanks, Charlie, and hello, Lakeside, and hello to those of you who are watching from afar. I thought I'd start with a little bit of a review of what we've done and who we've met this week in terms of biblical women and Black Lives Matter. So on Sunday, I started with acknowledging and discussing the racist past of the term uppity that I had inadvertently been using for so many years, or at least uh, ignorantly been using, but then turning that to an effort to instead emphasize the work of assertive resistance, which we find in so many biblical women. And so we met biblical women who were practicing assertive resistance, including Shifra, Pua, Yachabed, the sister of Moses, the daughter of Pharaoh, the daughter of Pharaoh's female attendants, Machlanoah Hogla Milka Tirza, Miriam, and the women who sang and danced with her, Deborah and Yael, Ritzpa, and today Holda. So if you've been following long, that's pretty good for one week. That's a lot of biblical women. So Holda appears in the book of Kings, in the second book of Kings. We divide them in English Bibles. So 2 Kings 22.1, and uh, I forgot to write her name up here. So there's Hulda, the prophetess, who we'll meet in this passage, and then oramus.org if you want to follow along on your phone browser in the New Revised Standard Version. Now, Hulda is following our other biblical women more or less chronologically as presented in the biblical narrative, even though... That's not necessarily the order in which the texts were written. So let me do a little background review on that, too, uh, as I've done some other days. So there's creation, the ancestors, the enslavement in Egypt, the exodus out of Egypt, wandering in the wilderness, conquest and settlement, that was Deborah and Yael, 
and then the united monarchy, the time of Saul and David, so that was yesterday with Hulda, and then in 722 BCE, the united monarchy falls to Assyria, and it just leaves the southern kingdom of Judah, and they take that fall as a theological warning, you better be careful, and that gets us to this time of the prophetess Hulda and King Josiah, who enacts reforms during this time. So the passage starts like this. Josiah, that's our king at the time, was eight years old when he began to reign. He reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name, here's another biblical woman, was Yadida, daughter of Adiah of Bozkath. Now, I'll pause here for a second. Uh, an eight-year-old king, I know, who wants an eight-year-old king? So probably his mother, Yadida, who is mentioned here, probably the queen mother was really doing the work of leading the kingdom during this time while Josiah was only uh, eight years old. Now, verse 2 King Josiah did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the way of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right or to the left. Now, uh, if you were with me on the day we talked about Deborah and Yael, I mentioned that there's an editorial framework in that book uh, that... Uh, surrounds the hero stories of the judges. And there is an editorial framework also in Kings. If you were to sit down and read First and Second Kings from beginning to end, you would first of all probably need a lot of coffee. But second of all, you would hopefully notice the editorial framework there, which is that the narrator evaluates each king according to their uprightness or not? Do they walk in the ways of the Lord? And King Josiah receives the most positive review of all of the kings. He really did the best job of anybody. There are, especially the, the northern kings, by, by this time in our timeline, the northern kingdom has fallen, but when the northern kings were around, and first kings especially, uh, they, they got lots of bad reviews. But King jo Josiah gets a double thumbs up. And uh, if, if there's any West Wing fans out there, uh, if you ever watched West Wing, you might not have noticed that the president in the show West Wing, everybody called him Jeb, but his name was Josiah. I don't think that detail was lost on the writers of that show. So here we have Josiah and the posit his positive evaluation from the narrators. Josiah was the best king. All right, picking up uh, 2 Kings 22, verse 3. In the 18th year of King Josiah, he's a grown-up now, the king sent Shaphan, son of Azaliah, son of Meshulam, the secretary, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to the high priest Hilkiah and have him count the entire sum of the money that has been brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the threshold have collected from the people. Let it be given into the hand of the workers who have the oversight of the house of the Lord. Let them give it to the workers who are at the house of the Lord repairing the house. That is, to the carpenters, to the builders, to the masons, and let them use it to buy timber and quarried stone to repair the house. But no accounting shall be asked from them for the money that is delivered into their hand, for they deal honestly. So the story goes that King Josiah, being such a good king, sends his secretary to the high priest at the temple to do what was supposed to have been done regularly, but which had not been getting done regularly because not every king was as good as King Josiah, and that was to empty the offering box and give the money to the workers, the carpenters, the builders, the masons, who were to use it to make repairs to the, the, the temple. I'm thinking the board of trustees here. So that's, that's, where, that's what's going on here. 
Now, then, okay, we're in verse 8 now. The high priest Hilkiah said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And when Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, he read it. Then Shaphan the secretary came to the king and, he, and reported to the king, your servants have emptied out the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of the workers who have oversight of the house of the Lord. That was their task. Shaphan the secretary informed the king, the priest Hilkiah has given me a book. Shaphan then read it aloud to the book. Now, the thing is, the, a book is not the greatest translation here because a book like this kind with a binding and a cover and pages, that did not exist yet. This was a scroll. And, and scroll, you, you should think like infant-sized here, maybe even a pretty big baby of a scroll that would have gone into a jar or come out of a jar that would have been toddler sized even. And reading this would be no small thing. And, and when Shaphan says to the king, uh, the priest Hilkiah has given me a book, this is a big deal. I mean, this is not like how most of us have bookshelves and bookshelves and you can go pick up free books outside of some bookstores and you can go to the library used book sale. No printing press, right? So a, a scroll is a really big deal. It's a hand copied uh, thing that you just wouldn't find something like this every day. And on top of this, of course, it's holy. It's a remarkable and unusual find. And scholars think that probably what Hilkiah found that Shaphan announced to Josiah is the core of what we now know as the book of Deuteronomy. And, and we think this because when we read Deuteronomy and we see the reforms that Josiah enacts, they align. Uh, so it's, it's really the focus of the book of De Deuteronomy on the most important commandments, that being, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. So in other words, Josiah got rid of the other gods that were being widely worshipped in the kingdom. And that aligns with what we find in Deuteronomy. Now, verse 11, when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. Perhaps sounds like an odd reaction to us, us, but this was a common mourning practice in the ancient world. It was an outward and visible sign that you were inwardly grieving. Another one is wearing sackcloth. We heard about sackcloth yesterday with Ritzpah. So Josiah seemed fully convinced of the authenticity of this word, and he was clearly quite concerned about what had been found and the fact that the people had not been doing what was in the scroll. Verses 12 and 13. Then the king commanded the priest Hilkiah, Ahikam, son of Shaphan, Achbor, son of Micaiah, Shaphan the secretary, and the king's servant Isaiah, saying, Go, inquire of the Lord for me, for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our ancestors did not obey the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. So to quote an old nursery rhyme, Josiah asks all the king's men to go ask for a word from the Lord about the scroll. And who would you go to for a word from the Lord but a prophet? So even though Josiah is already standing there in torn clothes, he's clearly uh, convinced of the, the weight and the authenticity of this scroll. He wants to go get an oracle from a prophet, a word from the Lord, to find out, now what? How much trouble are we in? What is going to happen? Uh, and so in 14, we find out about this prophet. So the priest Hilkiah... Ahibam, Achbor, Shaphan, and Asaiah 
all the king's men, went to the prophetess Huldah, the wife of Shalom, son of Tikvah, son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. She resided in Jerusalem in the second quarter where they consulted her. And nobody says, you know, there's five prophets these days. Which one should we go to? They just say, we're going to Huldah, the prophetess. There's no dispute. There's no debate. Apparently, that's just what you do. I'll come back to Huldah. But let's uh, finish out by hearing her oracle. And an oracle is just a Bible scholarly word for a word from the Lord that comes through a prophet, or in this case, a prophetess. She declared to them, thus says the Lord. Anytime you hear that phrase, thus says the Lord, that's prophet speak. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, tell the man who sent you to me, thus says the Lord, I will indeed bring disaster on this place and on its inhabitants. All the words of the book that the king of Judah has read, because they have abandoned me and have made offerings to other gods, so that they have provoked me to anger with all the work of their hands. Therefore, my wrath will be kindled against this place, and it will not be quenched. I'll stop there for a second. So this is not good news. <laughs> Destruction is coming. This is dire and frightening. This is the uh, this is the the Hebrew Bible theology that a lot of people are uh, uh, displeased with. This idea of an angry God. Uh, however, for our ancestors in faith, this was a really important aspect of God. How is anybody going to stay in line if God can't get really mad and make sure they? change their ways and do the right thing. So that's what we have here. Destruction is coming. But that for the prophets, that wasn't it wasn't just um, fortune telling. I mean, sometimes what they said happened, but it was also supposed to be a call to repentance. Change your ways. And we'll we'll see about that in, in a minute. So let me finish that off in 18 through 20. This is the word from Huldah specifically for King Josiah. But as to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall you say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, regarding the words that you have heard, because your heart was penitent and you humbled yourself before the Lord. When you heard how I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and because you have torn your clothes and wept before me, I also have heard you, says the Lord. Therefore, I will gather you to your ancestors, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace. Your eyes, she says to Josiah, your eyes shall not see all the disaster that I will bring on this place. So Huldah does have an encouraging word for the good king Josiah, which is that he will be gathered to his grave in peace. His eyes would not see all the disaster that the Lord would bring. It's kind of minimalist <laughs> encouragement, but you take what you can get, right? And it's well-deserved encouragement for Josiah, the good king. He did tear his clothes after all. He grieved and repented. He tore down the alternate worship sites uh, where people were breaking that first commandment and worshiping other deities. Uh, now, here's a little thing that keeps up Bible scholars at night, though. If we read further on in Kings, we find that, yes, just like Huldah said, Jerusalem was eventually destroyed because Josiah's reforms of tearing the, down those alternate worship sites apparently came too little too late. So eventually, yes, Jerusalem got destroyed by Babylon. But Josiah did die before that destruction occurred, like she said. However, this is the part that keeps Bible scholars up at night. He did not die in peace, as it were, in, sleep in, uh, in his sleep in his bed, but he was killed by Pharaoh Necho in battle. Uh, that's a, just a little troubling detail that I thought I'd, I'd mention, so it can keep you up at night, too. Uh, there are some interesting theories about it, actually, if you want to dig into the scholarship. So one of the things I want to note about Hulda, and, and the thing that really prompted me to start doing research on Hulda, 
is something that happened to me in my intro Bible class a couple of years ago. And uh, all of our religion majors at Oklahoma City University, most of whom are preparing for ministry in one form or another, we have them take world religions in their fall semester. So they're introduced to the idea of academic study of religion first. And then in second semester, we have them take an intro Bible class uh, with one of us on the uh, religion faculty to introduce them to biblical academic scholarship, um, which especially for students who have grown up in a lot of Sunday school and that kind of thing, it's a bit of a shift in thinking about the Bible instead of this is something with a comforting word for me day to day, this is something that we're going to look at and ask questions about and dig deeply into and so forth. So uh, when I teach intro Bible, I start with teaching a timeline. I have mentioned that earlier this week, uh, but to try to keep the students um, attentive and awake, uh, I'll probably have to modify, modify this with COVID, um, I, I have them do what I call a human timeline. So I have about 25 events on eight by 10 cards that are important to the biblical timeline, as I teach the Bible anyway. And I have the students stand up and file out the classroom door and go into a large space or outdoors, and I give each of them one of these timeline events. And then I tell them they have to line up in chronological order. Now, they're always happy when there's a religion major in the group, because usually they're the only one who has any idea, although they, they can usually get Jesus is born comes before Jesus dies. But they, the religion major will usually also have the leadership skills to just stand up and tell everybody else what to do, the, you know, the business majors and the dance majors and so forth, though some of them sometimes have a pretty good idea too. So anyway, they get in line, they line up in chronological order, and I have them stand sort of in a, in a half circle in front of me, and then I have them hold up their card as I kind of talk them through, narrate that, that scope of biblical history from beginning to end. And I always include in the timeline, the, it, this is the kind of thing I reviewed for you at the beginning, right? The creation and the ancestors and the enslavement in Egypt and the exodus. And when we get to, there's the united monarchy, and then there's the divided monarchy, the northern and the southern kingdoms divide, and the northern kingdom falls to Assyria, and then you just have the southern kingdom left. And I, then I always have Josiah's reforms based on the discovery in the temple, authenticated by the prophetess Huldah. And... I had this student, this religion major, who had indeed helped the other students line up properly, Maddie Day. And Maddie, you could just tell that she was really excited slash irritated when I mentioned the prophetess Holda in the biblical timeline. But she, uh, she's a very good student and she knows when to talk and when not to. And so she waited until the end of class and she came up to me and she said, Dr. Wolf, Dr. Wolf, how did I go to vacation Bible school and church camp and Sunday school for my whole life? And I never heard of the prophetess Hulda before. She was incensed. And I said, well, I think you have discovered the topic of your first paper for this class which, in fact, is what she did. She wrote a paper on Hulda for her first paper in the class and did a very nice job. And it really inspired me to research Hulda more and teach on her more. And I think the thing is, that one of the things that really struck me is the contrast between Maddie's surprise about a prophetess Hulda, and her surprise arose out of the fact of living in the Bible Belt of Oklahoma, where we are very predominantly Baptist, and where women clergy are not so much a thing, and where a number of our 
young women who are coming up into ministry have had people confront them and say, it's not right that you would be preparing for ministry. And so in that context, it made Maddie very surprised and excited about finding this prophetess Hulda in the Bible. So I'd like you to think a little bit about Hulda and reflect, and I wonder, had you heard of Hulda before? You can raise a hand if you want to. I'm seeing one. That's Charlie. <laughs> and he got my notes ahead of time. <laughs> so, okay. And then, the, so then the next question is, are we surprised to find a prophetess? In other words, a female prophet who is here, here in the text. Are you surprised? Not so much. Well, but you know, by now you've met all those other women this week, but maybe you knew about them anyway. And of course, Miriam and Deborah are also called prophetesses. So this is one of the interesting features about studying the Bible is that we all bring our own baggage along. And so one thing that Maddie discovered that day, and I learned from Maddie, was that she brought the baggage of assuming that the prophet would be male rather than female. And uh, so I, uh, I love the, um, the word that Will Gaffney uses for this in her book, Womanist Midrash. She, she calls the reaction of all the king's men to going to prof, the prophetess Hulda, she calls their reaction nonchalant. Now, they're not nonchalant about needing to get an oracle from the Lord, and they're not nonchalant about finding a scroll that tells them what they should have been doing, and they're not nonchalant about having the scroll authenticated. They're nonchalant about Hulda's femaleness. Nobody says anything about that. Nobody debates, is it okay? She's female. Uh, nobody says, oh, maybe we should go to this other prophet instead because he's a guy. And it, you know, we don't get any of that from the narrator. So to me, it's interesting. And in terms of uh, is Holda practicing assertive resistance or not, um, I don't know. Maybe she was just doing what God called her to do, uh, which is a pr pretty good model too. So the only thing that these king's men, as it were, are nonchalant about is about Hulda's being female. So if there were gendered norms that Hulda was supposed to have been following, which she was assertively resisting in being a female prophet, we don't know that from the text. Maybe it was just her. You know, she was just one of those people who did what she wanted and she didn't mind, and maybe other people did mind that she was a female prophet, but we don't know that. So this has caused me to reflect a little bit on what it is like to be a female clergy person, even in 2020. And uh, this month actually is the 20th anniversary of my ordination, I realized. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Because we didn't, we didn't have our association meeting and our conference meeting to uh, uh, celebrate that this year. I'll probably get a certificate in the mail yes, later. Um, so, uh, oh no, that's coming up in the fall. Who knows if we'll have it or not. Anyway, 20 years for me, and I was thinking about uh, when some of the things that have happened to me uh, that have been interesting as a female clergy person. And uh, for those of you who are female clergy persons or who know female clergy persons, we all have our stories. We all have our stories. So here's a couple of mine. Uh, when I was in seminary, and then for some years after that, I served as a chaplain intern at a children's hospital. And this was back before cell phones, so we had beepers. And one night, I was on call, and of course, my beeper went off at 2 a.m. or something. So I got myself out of bed, and I, I put on pantyhose. I mean, if there's anything that's going to make you grouchy at 2 a.m., it's that. And I got dressed, and I went to the hospital. I get to the ICU to meet the family whose child is in neurosurgery. And um, the father of this family, I, I said, hi, I'm Lisa, I'm the chaplain on call tonight. And he looks at me and does this. Can you do that? It's on my tag, so I'll do my best. 
I'm the way you're going to get some information tonight. There was another time uh, early on in my uh, ordained life when I was serving at a church and I went to do some hospital visits. And I had on this really smart clergy collar and a purple suit. And I was in the elevator in a big hospital in Cincinnati. And uh, (laughs) there was a woman standing near me in the elevator just staring at me shamelessly. And finally, she, she kind of gasped and she said, excuse me are you a priestess? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that'll work. (laughs) So like I said, we all have our stories, and some of them are funny, and some of them are sad. So in 1992, someone coined the term the stained glass ceiling, referring to sexism uh, against women in ministry, referring to limits in job opportunities and in pay and that type of thing. I have a friend, uh, Reverend Dr. Lori Walkie in Oklahoma City, who whenever she wears her clergy collar for a hospital visit or a funeral or a, a protest or something like that, she, she makes um, what I have termed educational errands. She says, I always run my errands when I have my collar on. It's educational for the people who see me. And she has a really cute clergy dress that I kind of envy. And she's, she's got some really funny stories about what kids in line at Target have said to her and that kind of thing. So I guess my point here is really that here in 2020, even, and so in the United Methodist Church, it's been really a long time since women were first ordained, and even longer in uh, the, the denomination I'm ordained in, in the United Church of Christ, and yet there are still people who are not nonchalant about those of us who are female clergy. So for me, that is one among a number of good reasons to revive Hulda, and I'll call that a start at reviving Hulda. So I, as I've been thinking this summer about the Black Lives Matter movement and studying that movement, I've been thinking about Hulda's fiery oracle, her anger from the Lord, right? She's saying the Lord's words. And when I read Hulda's story, I always wonder, who is our Hulda? Or who are our Huldas? And this summer, I, I thought of the protesters and their anger and their righteous words of truth the fact that they were bringing an oracle from God, at least in my opinion, as to where our society has gone wrong and what the likely consequences are. I also thought of this preacher who, uh, whose video went around on YouTube, Kimberly Jones, she's on your bibliography. What a fiery preacher, what a word she brought. And she picked up on some other prophetic words I heard this summer from um, Trevor Noah. So I am a big fan of of comedy. I think that comedians actually in our time are doing some of the best preaching work and social commentary of anyone, um, which is probably not a good thing for those of us who are clergy, but maybe we can learn from them. Now, if you don't know who Trevor Noah is or what his story is, I encourage you to read his memoir, which is called Born a Crime. Trevor Noah was born in South Africa, uh, and he is the um, son of a black mother and a white father, which in the time when he was born was a crime, uh, that mixed union. And so he has some striking distressing stories of growing up and having to pretend that he, as a mixed-race child, was not with his own mother, uh, lest he be taken away. And uh, so he certainly, having lived um, in South Africa under apartheid, uh, he has some important insight about race relations. And now he is a commentator here in the U.S. and 
uh, he had this this great reflection, um, which I also put on your uh, bibliography, where he was talking about George Floyd and the Minneapolis uh, Minneapolis uh, protests, and also um, Ahmaud Arbery and Amy Cooper, the woman who uh, called the police on the bird watcher in Central Park, emphasizing uh, the man's race. And in that commentary, Trevor Noah focuses on the idea of a broken social contract. He says people are so distressed that there's um, violence and looting going on. And I thought, well, you know, why do, does anybody follow those rules anyway? Well, they do it largely because of a social contract. And in our country, we're supposed to have a social contract of freedom and justice for all. And you know what? That social contract has really never been in effect. It has really never been for everyone. And so it's no wonder people are acting this way. And uh, so I found his, his uh, reflections on this really insightful and very much in alignment what, with what Hulda was saying. You know, look, you had this contract with God, the book of Deuteronomy. And in fact, uh, some Bible scholars have compared the book of Deuteronomy to other ancient contracts between a group of people and a ruler. And, uh, and Holda says, look, you've broken this, you're going to pay. And I think that Trevor Noah was saying a very similar thing. And then Kimberly Jones in her video where she was uh, preaching, uh, she picked up on that idea of a broken social contract. And she ended her comments by looking right at the camera, and it was kind of a, a person on the street interview at, in, in Minneapolis where the protests were going on. She ended this, this fiery uh, sermon with these words of warning that I, were so striking to me and I think to many people. She said, they are lucky that what black people are looking for is equality and not revenge. And after she had exercised all of this, uh, gone through history and talked about the Monopoly game example that I mentioned a couple of days where it seems like for a black person in America, we're living in this utterly unjust society where there's no way we can possibly catch up. And uh, then she talked about the broken social contract to think of that idea of all we really want here is equality when we have every right to want revenge. That was so striking to me. So I wanna connect that today with some thoughts about and questions about how can we repair the social contract? Because of course, it doesn't do us much good only to stop with saying the social contract has been broken and everything is so wrong. We need to think of some solutions. We need to think of ways to build bridges to repair the social contract. So I, I reached out to Charlie a couple of weeks ago and I said, you know, I, I, I'm guessing somebody in Lakeside is doing some of this kind of thing. And he connected me with Bob Brimer from the men's group here at Lakeside who has developed a, a program called Till Next Year TNT for short, uh, that the men's Bible study developed in 2016. And he said, you know, we asked ourselves, how would it feel to live in this county, in this, this place, and to see this gated off little utopia that we can't get into? How would that feel uh, for folks? And how can we, Lakeside, be more open than gated? How do we live in that uh, tension, in that paradox? And so he uh, and the men's Bible study reached out to the Ottawa County United Way to get some ideas. And uh, so they started this program where they bring in about 120 people, both kids and mentors, for a day of fun at Lakeside, right through those gates, you know, fully paid for and everything, entertainment, lunch, putt-putt, shuffleboard. And uh, then gave, and also gave everybody, kids and mentors alike, uh, another day pass so they could come again. 
And then Bob said, well, you know, you really have to talk to Dan Moulton because he's helped support this program. And he said he wrote me this moving letter about his experience growing up outside of Lakeside and wanting to come in. And uh, Dan gave me permission to share some of what he, he wrote. And he said that when he was growing up, Lakeside existed more in my imagination than in my reality. He said there was miniature golf, a strange game called shuffleboard that it seemed to uh, be played nowhere else on earth but Lakeside, and real tennis courts. There was ice cream, volleyball games, sleeping cats, and high school girls getting tans on the dock. It was magical. So Dan talks about his process uh, as a young person of getting to a place where he could spend time in Lakeside and uh, be part of the community. And he, he wrote these helpful reflections. I think there is an uneasy tension in the idea of a gated Christian community. And yet I do not believe that Lakeside can offer what it does without its fence. I think in the end, the real issue is not about fences. It's about the number and the quality of the gates. I think Jesus had something to say about this. The Men's Bible Study Initiative with TNT strikes me as an effort to build just such a quality gate and to demonstrate that Lakeside is more than a basket hiding its candle. So I wonder how can there be more efforts to make Lakeside seem less off limits? How can there be more efforts to open it up to those who have not been here, to foster unity at every turn, to diminish the fear that leads to division, that leads to violence? We all know how calming this place is. And I wonder how can we in turn give that gift to more people, to people who really need that calm in their lives, the gifts that I received here as a young person that brought me to the place uh, where I am today. And to bring us back to Hulda, how can we heed Hulda's warnings by building bridges to repair the broken social contract, both here at Lakeside and in the world beyond. So I end with a question mark, and now I invite your questions, and I think we have a microphone. In the back, Charlie. This is more of a, uh, a comment because um, I grew up coming to Lakeside from the time I was six months old. And uh, we, after marriage, we lived in different places. My husband's a professor. And when we came back and moved back to Ohio in 1990, our, our boys were older. So our son was in college at Oberlin, and our other son had graduated from Oberlin and was in the Peace Corps. Well, when we brought them to Lakeside, that was exactly their opinion. Mm. This is a gated community. I don't want to go there. Mm. And um, it was really sad for me because I love love Lakeside. So over the years, our minister, our um, our son that went to Oberlin is an ordained minister in the Episcopal Church, yeah. and he loves coming here now, <laughs> and, and taking part. <clears throat> We're sorry we didn't rent a cottage this summer because of COVID, and we couldn't get everybody together. But um, that is an opinion even of white people and especially white young people. Oh, I don't want anything to do with that. That's a gated community quote. So there, there is a message even to be gotten by um, white young people as well as, as minority young people. But I love Lakeside. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for that comment. I think that really helpfully expresses the paradox 
of the gates. And I think that many of us struggle with it. And um, I too have heard people who just wanted to no, it's not okay. You can't have a place like that that's Christian with a gate and you have to pay to get in, um, which you don't for chapel uh, or faith for living. Anyway. True. True. Yeah. True. Okay, right. I thought so. Um, so I, I think it's important to know that, that there, there are some people who just won't even give it another thought because of that. Um, and so I think that's... Uh, not only an issue for Lakeside, but probably a bigger societal issue that we could apply to a lot of things uh, that, that, that some people would deem white privilege, uh, economic issues, and so forth. Um, uh, my family lives in, in the city. Uh, it's much busier and louder, and uh, we are very careful to set our house alarm when we leave. And so there is a real sense of relief for us in being here. So I can experience that shift and so can, can my kids. And, um, but it's also a reminder to me of how many people in the world never get relief from that. And, and so uh, it's, a, you know, it's a big challenge. There are no easy answers to any of these things, but I think it's worth our, our efforts. I want to applaud the um, men's Bible study um, for what they've done. One of the things that they learned was these kids in Ottawa County have never seen Lake Erie. Oh. Some of them have never seen Lake Erie. I think that makes us pause and think about not just Lakeside, but the whole county of how we are a major part of the county. How can we make a change? And I applaud the men's Bible study for at least starting the starting the process. That's that's really great. And if you didn't hear that, the comment was uh, not only applause for the men's Bible study for the program, but that they discovered the number of kids who had never seen Lake Erie, who live right here in Ottawa County. Um, that reminded me of when I was a camp counselor, and uh, we had. Um, kids from downtown Cleveland come one week from certain churches and uh, some of the kids were, you know, they would startle in the woods. It was just so unfamiliar. And so, uh, I mean, it just says a lot about the needs for different kinds of education, for um, environmental education, and for our society to just do a better job of taking care of our kids. Do we have a comment over here? Yeah, go ahead. Curious to your your uh, feelings on this or thoughts on this. When when you read the literature of the Old Testament, um, wisdom is always in the feminine. God's wisdom is always referred to in the feminine, and and you're right that the mention of female prophetesses is small, minimal, <laughs> and yet the the uh, the truth, the the piercing elements that they bring. Are are dead on, I, they, they, you know. They they alter, the, as you say, the course of history. Um, wonder what your your thoughts are on that. You know that this is this is one who I, I had heard of, but only because I did a paper in graduate school on on the prophets. But um, you know, having worked with, uh, I worked with an, an older woman, uh, Manny Aronofsky, a Jewish woman who had survived. You know, she came from from Belgium and, and had survived uh, Nazi persecution. Uh, but her, her piercing view of the truth was, uh, was a, a godsend for me in my, in my research and my graduate work. Uh, but just, you know, because in the Old Testament, wisdom is in the feminine, okay? Why should it be a surprise for us to see truth tellers, the prophets, be women? Well, so my first thought on that, having just published a book in the Wisdom Commentary series on one of the wisdom books, is why didn't I think of that? So thank you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So the word wisdom is gendered feminine, which doesn't necessarily mean anything. But if you read Proverbs 8, you have to read Proverbs 8, and you get this depiction of 
this figure, wisdom, who was there with God at creation, which for many years I've been perplexed, you know, why is it just a trinity? Why isn't she in there? Uh, so this, this figure, women, uh, wisdom, who is personified as a woman, and uh, if, if we're careful about our theology, we'll say that any theological description is a personification. Um, so we have many descriptions of God, but that's one that often gets neglected. And you're right, it makes so much sense that, of course, there would be female prophets uh, given this wisdom tradition. There's also so much uh, tension, though, in, in those issues. So in, in Kohelet, in the book of Ecclesiastes that I just wrote the, the commentary on, there are these horrible misogynistic comments that sound like they're about women. And, and so, you know, what do you do with that given the figure of, of wisdom? And one thing that I propose, I'm not the only one who's proposed it, is that the author of this book is, is infuriated to not be able to find wisdom. And so is not necessarily cursing womankind, but rather cursing the futility of being on a quest for wisdom because it's so difficult to find. Um, but yes, I think Holda fits in that tradition and makes a lot of sense given that. But I think that I, I can't put words in Maddie Day's mouth, but I suspect that she was just as surprised the day we read Proverbs 8 in class as she was the day we did the timeline and I mentioned Holda the prophetess, because those are passages that don't get a lot of play. So I hate to... Um, be too hard on the lectionary, the Revised Common Lectionary, uh, because I do, I have tended to be a lectionary preacher. However, there's a whole lot of good stuff we miss. There's a whole lot of good stuff we miss. And so um, I am a huge advocate of some more holistic Bible study. And, uh, you know, you can do some of that even in a short sermon, but it, it's not always easy. So thanks for that tip. I'm going to write that down. Um, I just wanted to share something that um, we have had that same discussion about um, the gates and the community around us not feeling comfortable coming. Many people in the community around us has, have never been to Lakeside and, and refused, some refused to go. Um, and so how do we um, bridge that gap uh, of understanding? And, and part of it is the offering of the passes to come in for, for Vespers and, and worship. And, um, but one of the ideas that we've been researching is the idea of a dinner church. And we were thought, thinking about a dinner church in Lakeside, but um, there, Dan Moulton is part of this and myself and Reverend Karen Graham um, that we've been working. Um, researching this and we're thinking it would be better to do the dinner church outside of the gates with the understanding that Lakeside is part of the the reaching out um, into the community and that there is a pay it forward restaurant in Port Clinton Bistro 163 and so our hope is uh, our hope was to start this past spring in um, at Bistro and as a intentional place to not just have a free meal, but to intentionally talk about God um, in the community. So our hope is that by this next spring, we'll be able to do that. Um, so prayers for that. And um, just wanted to let people know that there are some ideas going that, on. That's a great idea. I love that. I think that's that's really cool. And, and I'm glad that you mentioned that. You know, something that that struck me while while some of you were talking about different initiatives within Lakeside is that the the most times I've ever been to Lakeside have been for Institute, for Akron District Institute Youth Camp. And I grew up going to camp to Wanakee. I worked at Asbury in the East Ohio Conference, uh, United Methodist Camps. And so for my family, my family was, you know, sort of mentally prepared and economically to pay for a week of camp for me every summer. And it just struck me, you know, when I went to camp at Lakeside, it got me in the gate. 
and uh, I think that's a really good thing to keep in mind. What a great model that the camps that happen here at Lakeside bring people from the conference in because the gate fee gets folded into their um, uh, registration fee. Uh, camps, retreats, I came here for youth group retreats. When I was in high school, I grew up in uh, Stowe United Methodist Church, and so sometimes when we would go on a retreat, we would come up here to Lakeside and stay at Hilltop House, and um, so those were times that I came in and the gate didn't seem like a hindrance, and so maybe increasing some of those type of things could be another idea as well. Well, I thank you all so much. I've been so delighted to be here and be with you. And thank you again to Charlie. And let me just take a moment of personal privilege to thank um, Charlie Yost and Barb Yost and Carol Reinhart and Ron Reinhart on behalf of me and my sister Katie. And she specifically told me to make sure and say this because now we understand how much time and effort and sweat and tears you spent all those summers with us as Lakeside Institutors, and that just meant so much, so thank you.